All right, all right. We'll get cooking in just a moment. As we welcome folks here, let's see, who's the first in? Who's the first in? John. John Monteith. Nice to meet you, John. Welcome. Lewis is coming in. We'll get cooking in a minute. So the question of the day is, uh, where are you from? Pop that in here. I'm from Woodstock, Maryland, which is outside of Columbia, which is outside of Baltimore, which is outside of DC for those folks. Denver. John's from Denver. Awesome. I love Denver. Love that place. Okay. Where are you from? I always like to see who's the farthest away. So now John's in Denver. He's the farthest so far. Where are you located, Miriam? Me in New yeah. York City. New York City. Gaithersburg, Maryland. Steve Smith. Uh, from Lewis is uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland as well. Both of you NIST. Um, could be could be HHS. There you go. Cool. Both of you from NIST. That's awesome. Welcome. Got folks from NIST here. We'll welcome everybody in a minute. So we'll get started in a minute. So the question is, where are you from? So the the farthest away we have so far is John in Denver, Manchester, Ma New Hampshire. We'll get up your way. Not too long, Sean Rice. Utah, Tim Waters got got the record so far, Patrick. Now, yeah. Patrick, you're are you actually from you're actually from where originally? I'm from Ireland, the west of Ireland. West of Ireland, love that. But you're in New York now, right? Yes, New York City, Manhattan. Awesome, Klamath Falls, Oregon. Wow, that's the farthest so far, Seth. So far, Seth has got it beat. Got Kevin in Connecticut. One of my favorite places to go in Connecticut is Frank Pepe's Pizza. Yeah, that's my that's my jam. You ever had Frank Pepe's Pizza, Miriam? Nope. Wow. No. That's wild. Is it? Prin Prineville, Oregon. I don't know which one's farther out. Klamath Falls or Prineville. I'm sorry. Good pizza, right, Kevin? Had a story about that, Kevin. So I had some extra pizza. Walked up in Hartford, and uh, Hartford, right, Hartford, and I was walking up to TSA with a pizza box, and one one TSA agent said, "Hey, you got good taste," and the other agent is like, "What are you talking about?" And uh, I have the pizza box in my hand. And I said, "This right here is the bomb," and I'm doing that at TSA. So hmm. I'm lucky I didn't get gang tackled on that one. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, so Prineville and Klamath about Klamath Falls about the same distance. All right, Jeff, thank you very much for that geography lesson. Appreciate you guys joining us, and um, we're gonna be talking about some some interesting things. Uh, Patrick here happens to have a little bit of experience in in doing things in courtrooms, right, Patrick? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> just, just a little bit. So he gets to be able to see things. All right, uh, we'll give about another 30 seconds. So let us know where you are from. We got folks, Oregon is I think the the farthest away so far. Every once in a while we get somebody that's like way far away. We had somebody from Singapore and Africa. So it was kind of wild. So I'm actually gonna be traveling to, to Ireland, I'm hoping, Patrick, in uh, right. October. October. Hmm. That's a good month, actually. Uh, September, October are generally good months because kids are back in school. Yep. You, don't have, you don't have too many American tourists, no offense. Um, <laughs> hey, I, <laughs> I resemble that. If you're going to, uh, uh, what I suggest to people going to Ireland, if you want to see really this uh, spectacular, they did this thing in the west of Ireland. They created a trail and they call it the Wild Atlantic Way. And it's basically just a series of road signs that brings you to all these interesting places along the Atlantic coast, from Donegal down through Mayo, Galway, Clare, oh, uh, cool. Sligo, um, and down into Kerry, around the Ring of Kerry. And it, it really is, it, it was a phenomenal marketing thing because it cost nothing except printing up a bunch of signs <laughs> and saying, hey, this is the Wild Atlantic Way. And it looks like a a wave www it's a wavy sort of a, a logo and it just points you've got an arrow and it tells you which way to go and I it's super it. interesting 
Does it take you to the Jameson factories? Uh, the Jameson distillery is in Dublin. Um, <laughs> you can go there. Uh, the Guinness Brewery is in Dublin. That's always a good uh, a good tour. Oh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do a, my favorite. My favorite is actually Middleton. Middleton, very rare. That's my that's my premium. If you've never had it, um, yeah. Well, that's owned that. by J that's owned by Jameson. And it I is think ain't owned by Jameson. So it's I it think is their distillery super. is in Middleton County Cork. Love it. All right. Well, we don't want to take too much up else up. We just wanted to make sure we had enough time for everybody to get here. We've talked about Ireland. We talked about going west and talked about pizza. But now we're going to get into the best practices for rigging safety and accident avoidance. And we want to welcome every everybody. If we missed your agency, we apologize. Hopefully we got you on here. Uh, this is truly an interagency briefing. I am really excited to hear uh, what you guys think about this uh, in 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 the government because of um, just some of the things that we see in safety. I appreciate the folks from NIST here laying out those pieces. Real quick, just so you can participate, uh, this comes from uh, GSA. It's provided to you for informational purposes only, not legal advice, and we're not affiliated by any with a, any agency. And your participation isn't an endorsement to purchase from anybody. So there you go. We do love 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 participation in the chat you will find that we will put in this is the these are the session docs that you can get get to as well as you can raise your hand and ask questions we'd love to unmute and just have the dialogue if you have any questions of of patrick i uh, will give you an example of why you might want to ask him some questions in just a minute those session docs include the presentation as well as some of the guidelines and other federal guidance for safety for rigging hardware. So we appreciate you guys joining us today. And as far as why in the world did you decide to come to a rigging party, uh, let us know. What If you're just interested in rigging safety, that's great. If you wanna make sure you have the latest information, that's fantastic. Maybe you're running projects for, for rigging or your boss made you come. Some Weisenheimer is going to pick that, Miriam. I am certain yes. oh, somebody yeah, sure. is going to choose more, that for more sure. More than one, probably. <laughs> well, so, I think you should have my boss slash wife made me come. Oh, boy. See? Oh, see what happens? See what happens? You get, you get a character here, and you never know what's going to happen. And you can just send it to hr at govbrief.us, and all the complaints can go there. <laughs> and um, Steve Smith, as we have an upcoming rigging inspection contract, and, uh, and and Lewis is new as a division safety representative. Love that. So um, give us a little overview about TPH, knowing that you're founded in 2009, you're master riggers. That's what you do on a daily basis, right? That's what you're all about. Yes. What we do in, in um, our company is based in New York City, and we erect tower cranes like the one in the picture here uh we do the design work for tie back steel we get the tie back the tie backs are those things you can see one two three four that's five i think in this picture it ties the crane to the building and as the building climbs up we attach the um the tie backs to collars that are around the tower and there's a whole mechanism for jumping the crane up it's referred to jumping up and down um so we install the cranes and we take them out. We provide the riggers, we provide the operators. We do other uh, regular rigging jobs. Uh, I was at Brooklyn Navy Yard for months. We were lifting, we were doing a precast garage columns were 120,000 pounds. I did the roof of the Arthur Ashe Tennis Stadium in Queens. The, you did that personally, right? Yes, that, that's a retractable roof. They found that the... Because of the weather, every time the every time there was rain, it cost them something like seventeen million dollars. Because shows that had, TV stations that had a, they were showing tennis, now they had to break to something else because it stopped because of rain. Uh -huh. So it made a lot of sense to put a retractable roof. The thing weighed two hundred and twenty thousand pounds. It was an interesting pick, a single pick with a single crane. Um, that that was an interesting project. I'll bet. Yeah, and um, and you also the Hercules crane. What what is that? The Hercules crane I designed from an existing design that came to New York City in the nineties. Um, it was a company in Thailand that was set up by Scandinavian engineers, 
and it, it was I bought one back in the 90s and then I saw a different type that I asked them to design and make for me. It comes apart, it goes on the roof of a building and it hoists things up from street level. So when you get a building that's, and there was a, an example on Pearl Street in New York City, the building was very high and it, it was very, very tight. You couldn't get, the crane couldn't actually be set up because the streets were so so narrow. So we brought our Hercules crane, which comes apart. We brought it up in the elevator, brought it to the roof, put it together, um, connected it to power. It's a um, three-phase 220 power. We have 2,000 feet of wire rope on the drum, and we hoisted everything from the street. Wow. It has a, it has a capacity of, I think the total capacity is about 13,000 pounds, but that's a sort of a nominal capacity. The practical capacity is six or 7,000 pounds. Um, when you Love, go it. On. Love it. So, and you also invented uh, and the patented shackle technology with the super shackle. We're going to be talking about that. And Miriam, being the owner, is a woman-owned small business owner who is getting blinded by the sun right now. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. so there you go. So we're going to end this poll in three, two, one. Any last-minute stragglers? 83% participatory in this so far all right let's there let's share this out i think this is really cool um so nobody's boss made him come nobody's a weisenheimer here that's the first thing miriam just saying great okay um so but then there's there it's 50 50 have they they've heard about um centering loads on shackle pins and 50 percent have it so this is awesome that we get to be able to help folks understand the importance of that right and then we have a few people that have been here before. We appreciate you guys joining us back. It's great to see you. And um, now we'll get into a little bit here. I'm going to give you introductions to to uh, to Patrick and what he has been doing. Uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, we'll review some rigging safety standards. We'll talk about the importance of making sure that your your loads are centered and mitigating the the human failure especially right patrick that's the biggest thing that we've got to be up against right yeah give absolutely. you a case study of this and this actually happened just the other day uh one of it was it you that got that picture or was it one of your operators that sent you that picture one of the operators sent me the picture and said this doesn't look right um what do you think <laughs> yeah, that's right so we'll talk about why it doesn't look right and we'll look at some of the standards, making sure that the shackles are made to your standards and BAA and TAA compliance is part of that too. So the reason why Patrick is here is this, this gentleman has been all over the place as an expert witness. Um, and that's for all types of, what, why do you get, when do you get pulled into the conversation? What are you, what are you, why are they pulling you in as an expert witness? Um, generally, for accidents that are related, right now I'm involved in, uh, there was an accident on the George Washington Bridge um, where an iron worker, you know, they were setting up. It's it's amazing when I see these accidents, I'm tempted to say to the, the, the plaintiffs, the guys who are hurt, what were you thinking? <laughs> I, I, or, why weren't you thinking? <laughs> I, like, I, I've been... This is my 50th year in the business. I started my apprenticeship in 1973 in Ireland. When you were four years and, old, is that what it was? <laughs> yes. And I've seen, if it's possible to screw things up, I'm fully <laughs> confident in any crew. I've had a ringside seat to some of the most spectacular screw-ups that luckily I can jump in and say, whoa, stop, this is not what we're doing. And very often... I mean, I've owned companies, um, union companies, non-union companies, and it's just amazing when I see some of these accidents and I say to people, but you had a drawing showing you what to do. Why did you change? And they go, well, some white guy in a suit came up and said they were in a hurry and they needed to get this on the truck today and they don't have time to do it according to the drawing. And I'm like, Okay, if that were me on the job, I'd say I have a drawing that shows the way. We, there was a case at the trade center; they were taking down a, a structure that had supported a tow crane for for rebuilding the trade center, and they deviated from the plan. The plan was good. They deviated from the plan, and these 
two iron workers, Native Americans, um, they got hit with a beam that, that came down on them. And I, I'm like, number one, why were you standing there? And I, I, obviously, we can't berate the people that are paying us as an expert witness. But why were you <laughs> it sounds like you're doing a good standing? job of it. Yeah, why were you standing there? And don't you know how gravity works? As a structural engineer, I have to be familiar with the laws of physics. You're struggling with the laws of gravity. Oh, like, my gosh. The stuff comes straight down. So, um, I mean, generally, when we look into accidents, it's shocking the, the level of and the layers of stupidity. And accidents never happen for one reason. It's generally compounded by two or three different things happening. And... You know, I see it with, I was a pilot, I see it with flying. Um, accidents never happen for just... For one reason. One simple thing going wrong. It's a combination. And, and I tell people all the time on a job, okay, there's something minor is wrong. Let's say, for instance, the safety latch on the hook is um, is broken. Fix it. And I don't know it's not that important. It could be one of the factors... And right. when you have an accident, the likelihood of an accident is actually the factor. If you have if you have four things wrong, you're not four times as likely to have an accident. It's the factorial for four multiplied by three multiplied by two. That's 24 times. So by eliminating just one thing, you reduce it to 12, uh, a factor of 12. So I'm constantly telling people, fix the little things. If your radio isn't working properly, Get a radio that is working properly because the operator may not hear you push the button and, and it doesn't cut in right away. Just fix the little things. And I see it all the time. Uh, and it's just that the, the, I had a structural engineer who um, qualified in Queen's University in Belfast and he came to the US and he came working with me and I sent him out in the field as a, as a, a, um, a project manager. And he said to me, I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked at the level of non-conformance with basic safety standards just, and just the level of stupidity in the field is, is stunning and so what we're going to be talking about today hopefully you're going to help us with what what to do what not to do and how you can mitigate some of those um i'm telling you i love to hear these things and i'm always fascinated because this is the first time we've done this this briefing so tell us what is your role in rigging and do you specify it? Maybe you're the engineer of record. I didn't even know that was a term until Patrick told me. Uh, purchasing, safety manager, rigging supervisor, or maybe you're the rigger super, uh, signal person, or maybe something else. And if it's something else, pop it into the chat so we know what that other thing is, because I wanted to. I want to make sure we understand what it is we can do best for you. Uh, but we're going to get right into the, the rigging safety standards and you can see some of the issues on the right hand side. Now, tell us about these standards real briefly. We have these in the handouts for those of you who just popped up. I'll put this into the handouts again, but tell us what these standards say and 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 then just synopsize it for us for the performance standards and some of the best practices for folks. Well, under ASME B30.26, that, that's the part that uh, um, specifies shackles. They say, they say the shackles have to have a five to one safety factor. In other words, that it can withstand five times the rated load before it it destroy it it gets it rips apart. So we test shackles by sending to a testing lab and they physically test them. But they apply the load to the center of the pin, just like on the left. You can see there's a shackle, and the the hook is in the center. There are washers on either side. Because the load is being distributed equally to the shear plane on the left and the shear plane on the right. But now, when you're in the field and you have a condition like on the right hand side, now you're not distributing the load equally between the left and right shear planes. All of the load is on the left side. So it means that you're you're actually violating that five to one safety standard. You now do not have a five to one because you're putting more load. Let's say for instance, in a 10 ton shackle, we put the load in the center of the pin. Now there's 10,000 pounds, five tons goes to each side. But if you allow this to happen and you'll see in one of the pictures later that it does actually happen. Now you're loading one side, maybe 75% and the other side is only seeing 25%. So where the test uh, factor 10,000 pounds going to the left, 
you're actually applying 15,000. So you're not, you, you don't have a five time safety factor there. So you're eating into your safety factor. And, and you never hard. want to eat it into your safety factor in any way, right? Absolutely not. I mean, it's a, in, in the event of anything happening, God forbid, when they start investigating and find that you were, uh, that you had violated that five to one safety, pro that's a big problem. And that is a big like I say to people, it's not a problem until it becomes a problem, but when it becomes a problem, it becomes your problem. So much. Let's take a look and see what, what folks are doing here. So we have a couple of folks who are doing the specifying. Um, some are doing the purchasing, safety managers, supervisors spread across there. And we have the others. Now, let me tell you about a couple of the others. Russell is an observer slash construction inspector. Very important to have that, right? And for John... He, he's a sprat technician and rigging goes hand in hand with rope access. I don't have any idea what a, a sprat technician is. Hold, hold on a second. Let me see what, what, let me see if I can get John to unmute for just a second. John, John Archibald, you there? Did you get on mute for a second and tell us what a sprat technician is? Unless, do you know what that is? Anybody else? You there, John? He can't find the unmute. Oh, <laughs> there he is. is. Go ahead, John. Me? Go ahead. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, so Hi, Sprat John. is uh, uh, Society of Profes Professional Rope Access Technicians. So um, basically uh, hanging on ropes and accessing places where you otherwise can't. Um, so a lot of the same principles, uh, load sharing on anchors. Um, you don't want to overload one side. You want to actually be sharing a load kind of thing. Um, so yep, sprat.org. There you go. There you go. Russell so also, also fellow spratter, apparently John, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. So, so you may have seen some of these things happen before, right? The, the, in some of these, uh, some of these situations. Yeah. Like figure two right there with it. That's a pretty low angle. Um, yep. so to reduce um, your, reduce the capacity of your shackle and the capacity of your your overall system so absolutely. similar absolutely similar so yeah uh, man i appreciate you joining us and look i learned something new what a sprat was man that's awesome so <laughs> thanks for so, having me. um this actually comes from the patent that you had provided and the importance of this right patrick that that you need to be conscious all the way across the board about how you are you're you're, dis you're displacing your load right absolutely on on every rigging drawing every rigging plan it will tell you to keep the load centered on the pin to avoid the figure four situation where you have to decrease uh, and you're overloading the shackle and as john said as john said i think john he, he said um it's um it, it's it happens it happens and you have to center it now there's a few different ways of centering it but they're all very very cumbersome in the field and if you're in the sprat world you're up on top of the building and you're ready to get going um uh, that that's you know you're not going to start putting washers on either side of the 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 shackle pin just to center the load and using gloves right so we see these winter time in in New York City can be a little bit brutal right I'd say and and try and top of the buildings a thousand feet in the air that's <laughs> absolutely brutal is the word that's right so when you're and and you're you have your folks down in the field that are that are doing the work which are which are awesome right they're they're down there, they're trying to accomplish the mission of attaching things and getting them up on the top. And a lot of times there's pressure, right? Absolutely. Time pressure is huge because the cranes are hugely expensive and the crane time is the most expensive time on the job site. And so you have lost components. You can see there's different ways to be able to center that load. You have a centering, what is, what do you call that? Like a washer, what, there's washers, obviously. What, what's the other part? That's a spool. The spool, I got you. So the spool, so that can help center center it on there. But then you you have parts, and sometimes the parts aren't right for that particular shackle. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. You have spools, but then you have different size shackles on a job. So now you're telling the guys, okay, I want you to bring out three different sizes of spools and put them on the pin in order to center the load. Uh, it's impractical. Um, there's so many ways that it can fail. You got the wrong size spool. You got the the the, the 
Uh, the spool doesn't fit, you drop the spool. It's just another thing that you don't need to have to do out in the field. And especially that bottom part, which is there's nobody that's the design engineer that specified that's there to take a look at what's happening. In, in, exactly. You know, because they're... Their job is to make, they do the drawings, workers' job to follow the drawings and instructions, right? Absolutely. Uh, the engineer record will, uh, will uh, or the, whoever does the rigging plan will specify what's to be done. But then the oversight is the foreman in the field who's being pressured, get it done, get it done, get it done. So there's nobody there to police them and, 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 uh, and make sure that they're, that they're following, um, that they're following the plan. So and so we, great. we we do see if you take a look there's where that's a shackle that was not properly utilized right yep um, either underrated or or otherwise and then you also have problems with the rope right that we're talking about this is the and and being able to have that you, when you have a problem like you said it may not be one single thing but it then starts to compound because you'll start you'll start to to have problems with the rest of the hardware too. Now tell us about this. Now you you created the um, the super shackle, right? So yes. one of the things that you wanted to address actually is done by this barcode, right? If you take your if you take your phone, if everyone wants to take their phone, you can actually go up to it on the screen. And and it'll take you right to the specifications for that for that shackle. It's really cool, and that's included on. Why did you wind up doing that? Well, when we get a batch of shackles, generally two thousand or twenty five hundred shackles from the forge, we take three of them and we test them with a third party. Well, we don't have the the forge test their own shackles, so we test them. Um, we take three three random samples. Then we get the test report. We send it to a company called Modern Industries in Erie, Pennsylvania, extremely impressive testing agency. And they send us back the report. I then generate a QR code, a circular QR code, and we attach that to the end of the pin of the shackle. So at any time, anybody in the field, a safety guy, one of the riggers, signal crane operator, he can go right up to that with his phone, check it, say, okay, I see that this... Uh, I, I see the test results of all three shackles that were tested um, and well, the, the proof load of 2.2 times the working load was applied. The pin could be removed by hand after the first turn. And I see that it uh, broke at greater than a five to one um, um, multiple of the rated capacity. So typically, if you want to get that information you'd have to get on to the manufacturer like crosby would be um a favorite and and they'll charge you they'll send you the test data but they'll charge you for it but then how do you know that that's the one for the particular batch uh, of shackles that you have so, this way it's an added feature that it gives you the reassurance that, yeah i i got the test data so it, it mitigates the making a mistake on on which shackle to use and making sure that it's rated properly right the, yeah, the other part that I really find interesting about what you you have that this is this is part of your design, right? And the yes. idea is to use a pin that automatically self centers. That's what that's what the patents for, right? Correct. So and it. it so, you so, so the biggest problem that we see is is folks that are down on the field trying to get the work done. They're they're doing the right thing by trying to get the work done, right, Patrick? Yes, absolutely. But that's when you wind up having some problems potentially. So tell us about how, how you came up with this and what, what you want to solve. Well, I've, I've seen for the last, you know, 30 or 40 years on every rigging plan that I've had, that it tells you to center the, the, uh, the load on the shackle pin, on the pin. But nobody ever does it because it's like, it's too cumbersome. You're out there, you're wearing gloves. It's, it's just another thing that you have to take care of is, yeah, well, you know, it's not that important. I spoke to an engineer, a good friend of mine, and I said, Did, have you ever specified? He said, I specify it on every rigging plan. I specify, keep the load centered on the pin. And I said, have you ever seen it done? He said, nope, <laughs> said, I mean, never seen it done. So I thought, well, okay, the guys are well-intentioned. They're out there 
and their priorities are like production, go, go, go. And and like we'll see with a, a photograph I got recently from one of our operators in New York City, um, you know, they don't have the full breadth of knowledge that the engineer of record has or the master rigger. And they think, oh, okay, uh, you know, we don't need this little part, this spool, you know, let's just go with it. And it allows decision making in the field that shouldn't be there. So having having a pin like this, I like to call it idiot proof. <laughs> um, it's not possible to screw this up. There's only one way it goes in, um, and you you can't possibly screw it up. Um, I designed a taper on the the back of the threaded part, and that gives us a little bit of bearing to help out the shear plane, and it actually improved the performance by twenty five percent when we did it. We tested it in the foundry. So, and also, the capacity of the particular shackle is matched to the radius of the depression in the center of the pin. So, if you're using the correct size choker, it nests in there very nicely because the diameter of the choker and the diameter of that depression are the same. For instance, if you're using a 10 ton shackle, um, the um, a 10 ton uh, choker is uh, uh, is one inch diameter. The radius uh, of that depression would be a half inch, so the diameter would be one inch. So you want to choker sits nicely in there, so it doesn't flatten. I've noticed over the years that chokers get flattened from going over a straight pin. So this is a big help. Though there is another way of solving this, you can use a choker with a thimble, but that costs more money. But this does the same thing as the thimble, and it doesn't cost more money. So oh. that's another feature of it. So got to love when engineers who are actually in the field, actually using stuff and seeing things working um, when the, when that creates, you know, necessity is the mother invention, right? So he, now this is a reason why. So if we take a look at this, this is, this is one of the pictures that came from your folks this week, right? Yeah. One of my operators sent me this. Uh, we put up a towel crane. Now this is a balance weight. When we're jumping a tower crane, when we're moving it from the elevation it's at and we're increasing the height, the crane needs to be balanced. You have a counterweight on the back of the crane, which tends to, if if you have if the boom of the crane is all the way up, the counterweight tends to want to pull you backwards, and it may be as much as 14, 16, 18 inches. So we can't climb the crane when we have that load moment, uh, you know, pulling you back. So we use a balance weight which is maybe a, a multiple or a, a, a factor of the counterweights. And we boom down to a certain point. The guys that are in the climbing frame will tell you there are wheels on either side for guiding the, the rollers. And they'll tell you, okay, it's balanced now because the roller is, is loose front and back. We're good to go. So now this 17,600. So the guy took a 10 ton shackle. So you say, okay, 10 ton shackle, we're good for 10 tons, 20,000 pounds. 20,000 pounds is more than 17.6, we're good. But you can see the wire rope has slid to one side of the shackle. So now, instead of having 10,000 pounds transferred to each shear plane left and right, you know how 75% of the load is on the left. So now, instead of 10,000 pounds, you've got 15,000 pounds, you're overloading it by 50 percent but the guy in the, on the ground says hey it's a 10 ton shackle the load is less than 10 ton we're good to go so that's why here having the 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 guy in the field giving him the responsibility to understand all of this it's not, not going to happen so you can see how something if you look on the left um there's a loss there's a loss of capacity. Now, you're still good, but you've taken your factor of five to one and you're down to maybe a two to one or a three to one. So you're nowhere near the safety factor that you're supposed to have. Now, on this, you have a static load. You pick it and it's static. But when you have a dynamic load, let's say, for instance, you have a load that's tied down on a truck or you have a, a load in uh, the cargo bay of an aircraft. Now that's a dynamic load because with acceleration, with G-force, you're increasing, you're decreasing. So it's really important not to compromise by being off center with the pin. So that's why we have, if you look on the right hand side, we have a depression in the center of the pin. The wire rope goes in that depression and it just is not possible for it to slide. So it's 
automatically distributing 50% of the load to the left shear plane and 50% to the right. The shear plane is the, the, the plane where the, the pin meets the body of the shackle. That's where it's going to shear um, under destructive load. And and as, as you mentioned, there's a lot of ways that they're they're working to mitigate this and make sure that things are centered on the shackle between washers and what was the other spool, right? That you spool, mentioned. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, and the, no. the idea is to make it, like you said, idiot proof. So now this is a product that you, that you created. So we just want to let you know what's happening and the reason why you did it, because you're, you're a crane operator. You're seeing these things ex after the fact you're up, you know, 500 feet in the air, right? And right. you're, you're seeing the, the dynamic loads coming up and you're all of a sudden, you don't know that that's even this way until mm -hmm. it's already 500 feet in the air. Uh, absolutely. Generally, the crane operator is more, he's a more qualified individual, but he doesn't get a chance to put his two cents in. If you tell the guy downstairs, listen, I got these spools or I got these washers. Now, when we pick up a balance weight, every time we jump to crane each phase and typically a section will be a six meter is 19 foot seven they're generally european sizes so every 20 feet you're going to put down the balance weight you're going to pick up the next section you bring it up you bring up the next section you put it on either a tray or a trolley beam and now you now have to balance the crane before you start your cycle again so now you have a guy down there and you're going to tell him Okay, every time you do this, I want you to pack washers on either side of the, the pin, uh, uh, either side of the wire rope to keep it centered. Uh, and typically on a, a on a day, we'll jump, you know, may, maybe between five and ten sections, depending on um, circumstances and the length of time we have on our permit. So, you know, typically seven or eight times we're going to tell this guy, okay, every time you pick the balance weight, we want you to do this. It's giving an element of discretion to him that we don't want him to have. We want to give him a shackle that says, just screw the shackle pin in all the way. You're good to go. You don't have to think. And generally, they don't disappoint us in that area. They don't think. <laughs> so, which is why you wind up in courtrooms from time to time. Absolutely. So, and and it, it's... um. The the idea, as you as you said, is mitigating the human error, making sure that that um, what needs to be done. And this is simple; it's not complicated. It's two pieces that screw together, and you're done. And if you're not sure about whether or not the unit can handle it, you can hit the the barcode on the on that or right. QR code, I should say. And the, the capacity is also right on there. It tells you that the the, the uh, you see on the right hand side it says three quarter high strength, and because we 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 manufacture and we test to military spec to the RRC two seven one H. That's a military spec. There are two two grades. There's an A and a B. The B shackle is the high strength. That's the only one that we produce. We don't do the the lower strength one. On the left, working load limit is ten tons. It also gives a quick um, indicator of a 45 degree angle because as John said earlier, the, John the Spratt guy, um, there's a reduction that you have to apply when you're at 45 degrees uh, or anything that's not centered. So um, it makes it, um, it, there's really nothing can go wrong with this. <laughs> yeah, it, if you don't screw it in all the way, obviously that's a problem, but I think most riggers understand that you have to screw the, the, the pin in all the way. That's the only the, the only thing that can go wrong. Yeah. And uh, I love the QR code and being able to go take it right back. And that, that takes, and you mentioned this as well, that this is part of the reporting that comes back that you're like, okay, let's make sure that all things from end to end can be represented with out having anybody in the middle change their mind on what it should be right that's the whole idea and you mentioned and this all, before what's that go ahead and also when your specs say that, that they want to use best practices in the rigging industry nobody can argue with you that this is best practices that the regular shackle has been used since roman times it's 2024. <laughs> this is the 21st century shackle. <laughs> We've abandoned the, the, 
the Roman methodology. And this is, uh, well, so when somebody says we want you to employ best practices, this is absolutely it. Love it. And real quick, you're just, just letting folks know about uh, BAA and TAA compliance. If you're buying it for federal use, uh, there, this has changed over the past couple of years. It's 60%. Now it used to be 50%, went up to 55. Now it's 60% now. And this year it'll be going up to 65%. I haven't seen when that is. If anybody knows what actual date that would be in 2024, we know that it's happening in 2024. These are the initiatives that are out for us. And then 75% in, in 20, by 2029 and yours, solves all that because you're you're manufacturing I, here in the united states i've also heard that if it's made of steel it's got to be 90 percent baata compliant but you know we decided to bypass all of that made in usa yeah it's, so it's I, I believe that it's 90 percent, and then 95 percent if it's structural steel for use in structural steel i don't know if that applies to this or not that's a great question no i'm not a lawyer i don't even play one on tv so <laughs> Well, I, I do. I do have a lawyer, a consultant on the BATA, and after being over and back, it's cheaper to produce overseas. But I decided, you know what? Um, in our business, made in the USA carries a lot of weight, and I figured, you know what? That's fine. There's a founder in Wisconsin I'm dealing with. There's a founder just outside Chicago. They're excellent, and I think that um, it gives me a comfort level when I'm out rigging. I always want to see Crosby. Well, up to now, I want to see Crosby. Now I want to see, <laughs> yeah, I want to see Tarrant. But, <laughs> and Crosby does sell spools to go over their pins, but the spools are not aligned with the pin sizes, so there's a disconnect there. But yeah, I've, I've, I, I want to see Made in the USA when I'm out on a rigging job. I love that. Anyway, this would be, I think everybody else here would agree with that too. Um, so like you said 21st century you're not back in roman times removing the human element and you actually have a lifetime warranty on this so it meets all the u.s standards all those pieces third party tested the whole thing and also for folks that are in the procurement side if you want to pass this on to your contracting officers it meets the far uh 6.302-1 which because you have a patent you can specify it and include it with the justification and approval documentation. And I highly encourage if you, if, for those, for folks that have not been here or, or seen anything quite like this, there's a lot of folks that didn't even know about it, right, Patrick? Is yeah, that yeah. if you want to, if you want to, um, to, uh, to participate in this, hold on one second. Where is my, where is my final thing? It is not working. Oh, here we go. Would, what, what you would like to do, if you'd like to to uh, get some samples, you can do that. If you would like to uh, discuss a rigging requirement where Patrick is here, he can talk about other things outside of this if you'd like to. And if you'd like to uh, talk about a blanket purchase agreement, I'm sure that they would love to hear about that for your procurement folks. If there's anything else that you would like to to do if there's anybody anybody want to you can raise your hand or you can pop a question in if you'd like to while you have a subject matter expert before you have to put them on the witness stand you got them right here and you can ask some questions if you'd like to and i appreciate john you coming out with the sprat components anybody got any other questions or suggestions or recommendations for patrick for what he can do to help uh, advance the cause of of um safety using shackles we'll be glad to discuss that there's a couple of folks that do want to get some sh samples from you to test them for themselves patrick so we love that and for folks that um are here you will get a copy of the video recording the session docs which i'll pop in right this minute just in case you want to gain access to those before we even leave here uh, you can also have one-on-one -on -one meetings with patrick and miriam mm -hmm. and those samples and you'll send out actually eight samples right yeah, we're sold out right now, but we have a, another batch being forged. Um, it's, it's probably, um, I, I, I can't say how how quickly we'll get the next batch in, but yes, we're forging four sizes, three eighths, half inch, five eighths, and three quarter. I'll send you a pair of each and check them out. Uh, see what you, see if you like them. If you like them, use them, order some more. If you don't, you have free paperweights. 
<laughs> there you go. Free paperweights, just in case. So that's good. So um, we do want to get you guys out of here. Uh, appreciate you joining us. If you have anything that you need, there's Patrick's information. There's Miriam. Miriam talks too much in these briefings all the time. But uh, we appreciate the fact that uh, I, I love that you are in this industry. Miriam, when did you get into this industry? Oh, gosh, that's many moons ago. But um, <laughs> I really got into this industry back in 1977, actually. That's awesome because you're a pioneer. Because yeah, not a whole lot of not a whole lot of women in in no, this there, world. No, there definitely were not a lot. Is of it women in is the it getting industry. better now having huh? more women in the industry? Or are you pretty much? Oh yeah, oh it? yeah. Now it's a much it's a much um, more welcoming place for for women con construction. But yeah, but it's been an evolution a slow evolution <laughs> i can imagine so mm -hmm. so we appreciate that um if we don't have any other the other questions we appreciate you guys joining us especially um folks that are doing this in the field i'm i'm hoping that this was beneficial for you um we kind of honed in on some very specific issues that that can be created by not having your the load centered on shackles simple thing right patrick simple yep yeah, but you know what? When people start researching accidents like this, uh, um, you know, aircraft in this Max Eight, uh, like the DC Ten, they had a bolt on a door that uh, would indicate that the door was closed. I mean, that was a tremendous tragedy, and people don't find them. And 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 then when they do find them, oh, you know what? That was so obvious. And people, I've I've given these shackles to people, you know, crane companies like Bay Crane in New York City. They're uh, you know, a, a huge uh, um, crane company. They love them. The guys are like, give us more. We're constantly sold out because they want more. You know, give us more sizes. They want us to go up above the three quarter sizes. So we're working on that now. But they love them because they, they, they see right away. It's like, oh, and the 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 um the tests of a really good pattern. As people look at me and they say, nobody thought of this before. <laughs> That's right. There you go. Only took what three thousand years or something. Yeah. When 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 did the Roman Empire start? I guess, and who knows? It might have even been the pyramids. For all we know, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, well, yeah. We don't know how they got those stones up there. That's right. But they're probably using self-centering shackles to do it, and they just lost yes. the technology. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. We'll get. We appreciate you all joining us. I'll end that poll. We'll get you guys out of here. Great stuff, man. I. I learned something new for myself, and I'm hoping that folks here learn learn some new things too. And uh, simple, simple answers. Simple yeah, answers. Touch, guys, if you need any, if you need anything, just uh, reach out for me. You can get hold of me anytime. Yep. And there's several folks. I think there's uh, like eighty, eight, eight or nine people that said they wanted wanted samples. So we'll, we'll make sure we get through those folks, and you can get the the addresses from them. Get those out to them. I'm 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 really interested in hearing. What what the govies think about it? Because um, you weren't thinking about it till you popped in here. We appreciate you guys joining us. You're welcome, John. John says thanks, Patrick. Really appreciate it. Yep. So um, yeah, we'll keep the conversation going. Spread the word a little bit. Help uh, help these guys um, help your safety work on the jobs. You're welcome, Tim. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Tim. Thanks.